I was in the army for 10 years and I definitely saw some things. I'll be keeping this account anonymous for several reasons. One, I know people on here, some of whom are still on the job and for their protection, it would be better if they remained anonymous. Two, um, OPSEC guys, I will try to be specific, but I will be leaving out specific dates and places. And three, I don't want anybody coming after me. Anyway, like the title says, I was in the army for 10 years. And during that time I traveled all over the world for deployments and training ops. I've seen a lot of bad shit the world has to offer, and a lot of good too. I was an infantryman and a sniper, and during my first deployment to Iraq, I spent a lot of time sitting on rooftops or inside of abandoned buildings. I would watch streets, city blocks, whatever, trying to pin down patterns of life and get a better idea of what was happening out in sector. Often my three-man team would get attached to a line platoon, and we would go out on a 24 to 48 hour mission to get eyes on an intersection or building where we suspected the enemy had moved. 99.9% .9 of the time, everything went according to plan. We would either spend all day looking at nothing, or we would get compromised at the break of dawn and get into a day-long gunfight. Or if we were really lucky, we would get the drop on the bad guys and end up ambushing them. A couple of times though, Things would happen that really divide logic or expectation. Now, understand that throughout this whole period of my life I was almost always sleep deprived. I was hungry and I was under extreme levels of stress. I don't discount the idea that at least some of what I had experienced was due to the above factors, playing tricks on my mind or whatever. Oh, and I also had one of two paranormal experiences from before the army. Don't know if that has anything to do with anything, but it's worth mentioning. Baghdad. We were on a foot patrol to check out a part of a sector we rarely went to. Not for any specific reason. The bad guys never went there, so we never went there. The whole area about three city blocks had been a Christian neighborhood before the fall of Saddam. But after law and order had broken down completely, and the Christians were either forced out or they were murdered. We were just going from building to building at night, checking things out. We found this one house with a room on the roof that had been built separately from the main structure, which in of itself was pretty common. What was strange was that this room had a door that was locked from the inside. It was a sheet metal door with a hand latch on the inside which you could lock with a padlock. For some reason, this intrigued me and I had an urge to find out what was in there. So we proceeded to go to town on this door with our breaching kit. It took about 20 minutes of solid work before we yanked this freaking door open. First off at this point, I'm a seasoned combat soldier. I had seen some shit and I had done some shit. I was not easily spooked. But this room scared the hell out of me as soon as we had opened the door. There is a single hallway leading back to a T intersection. It was pitch black and the smell wafting out of there was like a butcher shop. Blood, raw meat, and so on. My hackles are up at attention at this point. We enter slowly and we spread out to check the structure. There were several rooms, all with dried blood covering the floor. Smears on the walls. It was evident that some horrific shit had happened in there. The last room contained an old metal bed frame. With leather restraints and wires running off to the opposite corner where a car battery had sat. Also, there was an oppressive heaviness in the whole place. Like the air had weight. We got the hell out of there as quickly as we could. The strangest part was that it was locked with a padlock. And it was dead bolted from the inside. But there was absolutely no other way out besides that door. No windows, one door locked from the inside. We never figured that one out, but I still think about it from time to time. That same night, we found another house locked from the inside. Bullet holes all over the walls and please God help us written over and over on the wall in Arabic. The words were written in red ink. And I swear to God, 
and one of the words was dripping wet red down the wall. Our interpreter said that it was a bad place and we noped the hell out of there and back to the COP as quickly as possible. Later on, during the Afghan winter the war basically shuts down and everybody takes a breather until spring and summer. The Taliban goes into Pakistan to rearm and collect new recruits. But that doesn't change the fact that patrols still need to go out and the business of war still needs to be conducted. So my platoon gets this mission to go out and strike our APCs and post up at a base of some hills on the afghan Paki border. We were told we would be there for three days tops. It ended up being two weeks before helicopters came and pulled us out. The second night we were there, a massive snowfall had happened, and over two feet of snow had dropped. We were snowed in basically. Our four vehicles were in a wagon wheel, asses in, and noses out in a circle to watch all angles of approach. Someone was always on guard in each of the trucks, scanning their sector with thermals and night optics. So there we were, stuck with nothing to do. The first day after the snowstorm which had lasted two days, I lowered the ramp on my vehicle and I saw fresh footprints weaving in and out of our perimeter and coming from outside and up the hill. Whoever was walking around barefoot? And naturally, I was creeped out. No one was outside during the snow except to use the bathroom and all of their tracks were easily identified. The mystery tracks kept showing up randomly the whole time that we were out there. Eventually I took a small patrol up to the hill following the tracks that always led down, never back up. When we got to the top of the hill and the tracks just ended, and no explanation given. When we got pulled out, I took a couple of the other platoon NCOs aside and I warned them, and they just shrugged it off. And by the time they got back two weeks later, they all acted like nothing had happened out there. But one soldier told me that the tracks kept showing up every morning. Fresh. There were even muddy barefoot prints inexplicably crisscrossing the tops of the strikers. Sometime later I found myself in Afghanistan again. My company was broken up by platoons and each platoon was stuck out in their own outpost in the middle of nowhere Afghanistan. We were down south on the Argandab River which was used as a rat line, smuggling weapons and fighters south from Pakistan into Kandador province. Our job was to interdict the smuggling and to try and disrupt their movement. I can't vouch for others that have been there but to me Afghanistan was a spooky place, especially at night. Where I was, there was a huge mountain range behind our outpost and we were situated kind of on a slope. The ground sloped down to the river and then shot back up the opposite side. All of the villages were down on the riverbanks where the farmers could work on their crops. And there was absolutely no light pollution, and we were at a reasonably high elevation. And so many nights I would lay out on top of our bunker and look up at the stars. And when the moon was full, the river was illuminated like a silver ribbon cutting through the valley. Occasionally, I would see shapes moving around down by the water, but no biggie. Probably farmers working in the cool night as opposed to the blistering heat of the day. There was a platoon of Navy SEALs that lived on the base when we got there, and they pretty much told us not to patrol at night. The Afghan army guys that were with us always told us these crazy stories about how the Taliban were wolves or more specifically werewolves. It sounded like total bullshit, but our interpreters always told us that it was true when we would laugh about it. Anyway, one night, I'm up in the tower, checking out the mountain with the computer assisted launch unit, which is the computer part of a javelin missile. By itself, it's really useful as a night optic as long as you don't have to haul it around. It's got great thermals and decent night amplification. Suddenly, all the stray dogs we had living with us started going nuts barking at the mountain. I'm thinking that this is going to be good. There's obviously Taliban creeping around. I take a look with the CLU and I see a thermal signature that looks like a man moving around behind the rocks. He's poking his head out occasionally and looking in our general direction. I can even make out his beard and some facial features. 
He dips down behind the rock and he disappears. Like the guy was gone. I scan around for a couple of minutes looking for him. And just when I'm starting to get alarmed by his sudden disappearance, I see an amorphous blob of heat shoot out from behind the rock and come quickly down slope towards us. I yelled out and I woke up the dude next to me. He gets out his 50 cal and just starts lighting up that whole area. Eventually, he shot off like 60 to 70 rounds and I explained what I saw. He laughed it off and called up the shooting as a test fire. This whole time, the dogs are still barking. I'm looking around with my night vision just in time to see a huge Afghan mountain dog loping off down the river behind us. Around the fall of 2018, we were back from Iraq and trying to settle back into the garrison mindset. And dial things back a notch as it were. Everybody was waiting to go on block leave for 30 days and come back ready for round two. It was during that time that I got promoted to sergeant and I put in charge of my first fire team. Part of every new NCO's duties is to provide the beer for the platoon-wide NCOPD, or better known as the Non-Commissioned Officer Professional Development Class. Basically an excuse for all the sergeants to get blasted together and swap stories, and share advice and so on. One of the senior guys in my company had been in the army for quite a while. He had been to Somalia for Black Hawk Down, Kosovo, Bosnia, and Desert Storm before OIF and OEF. He told me about waiting on the Saudi side of the berm waiting to go into Iraq. Stealth fighters and bombers flying by overhead to knock out Iraqi army positions. The roar of paladins losing their missiles against unexpected armor and infantry miles away. They waited in that desert for six months before finally crossing into Kuwait. By the time they got there, the war was pretty much over. He was in an army cavalry unit and saw some limited action, mainly against poorly trained and equipped conscript units and ancient Soviet tanks. The American war machine swept over those poorly defended positions easily, and within 72 hours the ground war was over. Now I know everybody has seen Jarhead and seen the news footage of the Highway of Death. My buddy wasn't involved in that part of the ground action. His unit was part of the Anvil, the retreating Iraqis hit during their flight from Kuwait. After everything was said and done, they still spent the next few months on the ground basically cleaning everything up. He told me stories about clearing Iraqi bunkers and trench complexes, sifting through the remains of entire companies wiped out in the bombing or whatever. Up to this point, what he had described was pretty typical of a major ground action. But I still can't imagine finding myself in the position of being in a major conventional war. He went on to describe one day in particular, towards the end of his time on the ground. They woke up from their hastily dug fighting positions in the middle of the desert, wiped the grimes out of their eyes and ate a quick MRE, and tried to destroy an Iraqi radar site. His platoon was tasked with collecting any intelligence they might find and collecting dog tags of the corpses that littered what seemed like the entire Kuwaiti desert. They still had to be careful. A handful of guys had already been killed by booby traps the Iraqis had strung up before retreating. They arrived on site and started their sweep. There were dozens of charred corpses scattered around outside. The site was a relatively deep and well-constructed bunker that contained the CP, and a trench line about 100 meters long. Strewn about were pictures of wives and kids, personal effects, letters, books. Anything that hadn't been destroyed in the bombings was collected by the troops as war trophies, or brought back to S2 for analysis. He found himself alone down in the bunker. It was a rectangular concrete box, with a machine gun slit in the front. Think Saving Private Ryan. The roof was half collapsed with a large hole punched through it where a bunker buster had burrowed down and incinerated the occupants. And there is a dead Iraqi slumped across a DSSHK machine gun, and the Soviet version of the 50 cal. He even said that he got a really creepy vibe from being down there. Aside from the dead machine gunner, there were the remains of at least three others in there, but they were closer to being completely atomized. They must have been directly under the bomb when it fell. 
My buddy quickly snatched the machine gunner's dog tags off his neck, stuffed them in his pocket, and he left back to the surface. Later on, the platoon was gathered together eating lunch in the scorched sand. He described it like Jarhead, where every time he took a step it left a footprint of white sand in the black and top layer. Anyway, the guys were comparing stories about what they had seen and what trophies that they had collected. They got down to the dog tags that they had, and they started comparing the numbers that they had managed to collect. Some guy had a pile of tags, others only had a few. My buddy had the one set that he had found in the machine gunner. He went on to tell some friends about how creepy it had been at the bunker and how he felt kind of bad for that gunner. Manning his position for the last moment, covering his buddy's retreat in the face of the Americans. One of his friends asked, What machine gunner? He had also been down in the bunker, but he didn't see any bodies down there. Thinking that his friend was mistaken, maybe there was a different bunker that he hadn't seen. He went back after lunch just to make sure. He stepped down into the bunker and sure enough, there was the DSSHK with no gunner. He said at this point that the hair in the back of his neck was standing on end. He was sure that the dead guy had been there. And that's when he noticed the drag marks through the charred topsoil. And they led across the floor and up the steps to the surface. He followed them out away from the fighting position about 50 meters. Lying in the sand was the gunner. His body was frozen in a low crawl position. His left leg straight back. His right knee cocked up. Left arm reaching forward and raised off the ground as if reaching for something. Maybe a way back home. He assumed that one of the messed up guys in his platoon had moved the body, but when he asked, nobody fessed up. On the drive back, he realized that the machine gunner had been facing towards the Iraqi border.